Ladies and gentlemen, just like we did for the uh, sentencing phase, we have copies of the jury charge for you to follow along. So if those could be uh, distributed at this time to the jurors and alternates. Also, uh, as we did with the trial phase, uh, they'll hand out pens to each of you. And as soon as you get a copy of the jury charge, I'd like you each to uh, put your juror number on your copy so that we can collect these. As before, these uh, copies of the charges are not to leave uh, the jury room once you're back there uh, to begin your deliberations. Alternates who receive a copy of these will be required to leave your copies in the courtroom uh, once the 12 jurors are excused for deliberation. You can't take them with you. It would appear everybody has a, a copy of the jury charge. So members of the jury, you have heard the evidence and the arguments of counsel, and it's now my duty to instruct you on the law that is applicable to this proceeding. The court and the jury have separate distinct functions. It is your function to decide the disputed facts or disputed questions of fact, and to determine what sentence shall be imposed upon Sean M. Great, and it's my function to provide you appropriate instructions on the law. It is your sworn duty to accept these instructions and to apply the law as it is given to you. You are not permitted to change the law nor to apply your own idea as to what you think the law should be. During your deliberations, you will decide whether Sean M. Great shall be sentenced to a life imprisonment without parole eligibility for 25 full years, or life without parole eligibility for 34, 30 full years, or life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death. In order for you to decide that the sentence of death shall be imposed upon Sean M. Great, the state of Ohio must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances of which the defendant was found guilty are sufficient to outweigh the factors in mitigation of imposing the death sentence. The defendant does not have any burden of proof. Reasonable doubt is present when, after you've carefully considered and compared all the evidence, you cannot say you are firmly convinced that the aggravating circumstances of which the defendant was found guilty outweigh the mitigating factors. Reasonable doubt is a doubt based on reason and common sense. Reasonable doubt is not mere possible doubt because everything relating to human affairs or depending on moral evidence is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof of such character that an ordinary person would be willing to rely and act upon it in the most important of his or her own affairs. Sean M. Great has been convicted of more than one count of aggravated murder with aggravating circumstances. The penalty for each separate count must be determined separately. Only the aggravating circumstances related to a given count may be considered and weighed against the mitigating factors in determining the penalty for that count. Although you found Mr. Great guilty of more than one count of aggravated murder as to Elizabeth Griffith and or Stacy Hicks, a.k.a. Stacy Stanley, respectively, you will only determine a penalty for counts one and seven. You shall not consider for any purpose the offenses or specific, uh, specifications contained in the other counts. The aggravating circumstances that you will consider as to count one are A, the offense in count one was part of a course of conduct involving the purposeful killing of or attempt to kill two or more persons by the defendant, and B, the offense in count one was committed while the defendant was committing, attempting to commit, fleeing immediately after committing, or attempting to commit the offense of kidnapping, and the defendant was the principal offender in the commission of the aggravated murder. The aggravating circumstances that you shall consider as to count seven are A, the offense in count seven was part of a course of conduct involving the purposeful killing of or attempt to kill two or more persons by the defendant. 
and B, the offense in count seven was committed while the defendant was committing, attempting to commit, or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit the offense of kidnapping and or rape and or aggravated robbery, and the defendant was the principal offender in the commission of the aggravated murder. You shall not give this specification any additional weight simply because there are three uh, predicate offenses listed. It is a single aggravated circumstance. The aggravated murder itself is not an aggravating circumstance. You may only consider the aggravated circumstances that were just described to you and which accompanied the stated aggravated murder. Mitigating factors are factors about an individual or an offense that weigh in favor of a decision that a life sentence rather than a death sentence is appropriate. Mitigating factors are factors that diminish the appropriateness of a death sentence. You must consider all of the mitigating factors presented to you. Mitigating factors include but are not limited to the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history, character, and background of the defendant, and whether the victim of the offense induced or facilitated the offense or any other factors that weigh in favor of a sentence other than death. This means that you are not limited to the specific mitigating factors that have been described to you. You should consider any other mitigating factors that weigh in favor of a sentence other than death. Any one of these mitigating factors standing alone is sufficient to support a sentence of life imprisonment if the aggravating circumstances are not sufficient to outweigh that mitigating factor beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, the cumulative effect of the mitigating factors will support a sentence of life imprisonment if the aggravating circumstances are not sufficient to outweigh the mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not necessary that the members of the jury uh, unanimously agree on the existence of a mitigating factor before that factor can be weighed by any juror against the aggravating circumstances. The procedure that you must follow in arriving at your verdict in this phase of the trial is prescribed by law, and in this regard you shall consider all of the testimony and the evidence relevant to the aggravating circumstances the defendant was found guilty of committing and mitigating factors raised both at, are raised at both phases of the trial and the final arguments of counsel. You shall then decide whether the state of Ohio proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors present in this case. It is the quality of the evidence regarding aggravated circumstances and mitigating factors that must be given primary consideration by you. The quality of the evidence may or may not be the same as the quantity of evidence. That is the number of witnesses or exhibits presented in this case. If all 12 of you find that the state of Ohio proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances the defendant was guilty of committing are sufficient to outweigh the mitigating factors in this case, then it will be your duty to decide that the, death, that the sentence of death shall be imposed upon Sean M. Great. If you find that the state of Ohio has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances Sean M. Great was guilty of committing are sufficient to outweigh the mitigating factors uh, in pres present in this case, then it will be your duty to decide which of the following life sentence alternatives should be imposed. The sentence of life imprisonment with no parole eligibility until 25 full years of imprisonment have been served the sentence of life imprisonment with no parole eligibility until 30 full years of imprisonment have been served, or life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. If the weight of the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating factors are equal, then you must proceed to consider the life sentence alternatives. You are not required to unanimously find that the state failed to prove that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors before considering one of the life sentence alternatives. You should proceed to consider and choose one of the life, all sentence, life sentence alternatives if any one or more of you conclude that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors. One juror may prevent a death penalty determination by finding that the aggravating circumstances do not outweigh the mitigating factors. You must be unanimous on one of the life sentence alternatives before you can render that verdict to the court. 
If you cannot unanimously agree on a specific life sentence, you will then inform the court by written note that you are unable to render a sentencing verdict. The opening statements and final arguments of counsel are designed to assist you, but they are not evidence. Although the arguments of counsel are not evidence in this case, the law permits you to consider the arguments of counsel to the extent that they are relevant to the sentence that should be imposed upon Sean M. Gray. Some of the evidence and testimony that you considered in the trial phase of this case may not be considered in this sentencing phase. For purposes of this proceeding, you are to consider only that evidence admitted in the trial phase that is relevant to the aggravating circumstances of which the defendant has been found guilty and to any of the mitigating factors. Based on what was admitted this morning, you will consider the trial phase testimony of uh, the following witnesses. That's Special Agent Larry Hootman, Special Agent Ed Staley, Tina Schwartz, Officer Cody Hying, Rebecca Taylor, Cindy Swanger, Corey Stanley, Wayne Bright, Nathaniel Keck, Joanna Smith, Sergeant Darcy Baker, John's Josh Smith, San Fan Fan or Sonny, Deputy Cody Major, Deputy Robert Ross, Sergeant Mike Freelon, Special Agent David Hammond, Officer Kurt Dorsey, Captain Dave Lay, Detective Kim Lee Major, Detective Brian Evans, Jimmy Sue, Detective Gary Alting, Lieutenant Tim Schreffler, Dr. Todd Barr, Dr. Dale Tomei, Beth Jackenheimer, Christine Hammett, Emily Feldenkris, Chris, and Officer Joel Eisenhower. You are specifically instructed not to consider any of the trial phase testimony of Sarah Miller, Sergeant James Cox, Pam Miley, Officer Donovan Linder, Tom Molino, Officer Mark Boggs, Officer Mike Bittinger, Officer Matt Brown, Curtis Connor, Lieutenant Scott Smart, Lisa Riley, Chad Kaufman, Lori Svillick, Tamara Whalen, Chief David Marcelli, Officer Jeremy Jarvis, Officer Abraham Newman, Raymond Fuller, Deborah Steinauer, Sarah Fairchild, and Officer Lee Eggeman. You will also consider all evidence admitted during the sentencing phase. For purpose of the sentencing phase, only the following sentencing phase exhibits will be committed, and this list that you have is one table that runs from the left column through multiple pages, then continues on the right column uh, to conclusion. So you'll have exhibits 2, 3, 8, 14, 15, 34, 44. There should be a redacted exhibit between 34 and 44 that you will not consider. Exhibit 46, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 75, 76, 98, 103, 104, 108, 115, 116, 117, 118, 121, 125, 134, 142, 143, 144, 147, 148, 150, 151. 154, 155, 156, 157, 158, 159, 160, 163, 164, 165, 168, 169, 170, 172, 174, 209, 211, 259, 275, and 276. As well, you'll consider Exhibit 277, 278, 279, 280, 281, 282, 283, and 283B, 284, 285, 286, 287, 288, 289, 290, 291, 292, 294, 295, 296, 297, 298, 299, 300, 301, 302, 303, 304, 305, 308, 309, 310, 311, uh, 323, 324, 326, 327, 329, 330, 331, 332, 334, 335, 359, 361, 362, 363, 364, 365, and 366. 373, 374, 382. There's an exhibit that's been redacted that you will not consider between 382 and 385, with 385 being the final exhibit. 
These exhibits, which you will consider, will be provided to you uh, in the jury room. And of course, you uh, are to consider the mitigating um, evidence that was permitted or presented by defense counsel, including uh, the testimony of uh, the witnesses that, that were called by the defendant. You must not speculate as to why the court sustained an objection to any question or what the answer to such question might have been. You're not to draw any inference or speculate on the truth of any suggestion included in a question that was not answered. And you're to disregard any statement or answer to a question that the court had obvious, uh, previously instructed you to disregard. I think we had a few of those during the course of the trial today. You are the sole judges of the facts, the credibility of the witnesses, and the weight of the evidence. To weigh the evidence, you must consider the credibility of the witnesses, and you will apply the test of truthfulness which you apply in your daily lives. These tests include the appearance of each witness on the stand, his or her manner of testifying, the reasonableness of the testimony, the opportunity he or she had to see, hear, and know the things concerning which he or she testified, his or her accuracy of memory, frankness or lack of it, <coughs> interest and bias, if any, together with all the facts and circumstances surrounding the testimony. Applying these tests, you will assign to the testimony of each witness such weight as you deem proper, and you're not required to believe the testimony of any witness simply because he or she was under oath. You may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the testimony of any witness. It is your province to determine what testimony is worthy of belief and what testimony is not worthy of belief. It is not necessary that the defendant, Sean M. Gray, take the witness stand or make a statement. The defendant has a constitutional right not to testify or make a statement, and the fact that uh, Mr. Gray did not testify or make a statement must not be considered for any purpose. Generally, uh, a witness may not express an opinion. However, a person who follows a profession or special line of work may express his or her opinion because of his or her education, knowledge, and experience. Such testimony is admitted for whatever assistance it may provide. Questions uh, have been asked when, with, in which an expert witness was permitted to assume that certain facts were true and to give an opinion based on such assumption. You must decide whether the assumed facts upon which the expert based his or her opinion are true. If any assumed fact was not established, you will determine its effect upon the opinion of the expert. As with other witnesses, upon you alone rests the duty of deciding what weight should be given to the testimony of any expert. In deciding its weight, you may take into consideration his or her skill, experience, knowledge, veracity, familiarity with the facts of this case, and the usual rules for testing credibility and deciding the weight to be given to testimony. When you consider the nature and circumstances of the, the offense, you may only consider them if they have any mitigating value. You may not consider the nature and circumstances of the crime as an aggravated circumstance. You must not be influenced by any consideration of sympathy or prejudice. It is your duty to carefully weigh the evidence, to decide all disputed questions of fact, to apply the instructions of the court to your findings, and to render your verdict accordingly. In fulfilling your duty, your efforts must be to arrive at a just verdict. Consider all the evidence and make your finding with intelligence and impartiality and without bias, sympathy, or prejudice. If during the course of the trial the court said or did anything that you consider an indication of the court's view on the facts, you are instructed to disregard it. You will have four verdict forms in your possession for each count. So there will be a total of eight, again, four verdict forms for each count. And I'll read these verdict forms uh, applicable separately to each count in precisely the same order as my previously or as my previous uh, instructions were presented to you. You're not to make any inference from the order in which I read these forms to you. First, if you would look up here, because those verdict forms are listed in the printed instructions in your hand, but I want to show you the verdict forms. They're, they are similar in format to what you had during the trial phase. The verdicts that I will be reading from you or to you from the jury charge are basically repeated here on each of the four verdict forms. 
In this case, you will get four separate verdict forms for each charge. So I have four for count one, and I have four verdict forms for count eight, or excuse me, count seven. This is a little different than the trial phase because I'm not going to ask you to write in any type of finding on any one of these verdict forms. You're going to get four verdict forms for each charge. You will complete only one of the four verdict forms for each charge consistent with your findings and then all 12 jurors will sign that verdict. There's no finding that has to be uh, written in. Your findings will be reflected by the verdict form that you complete and return to the court and that's how your finding will be determined. These verdict forms are captioned uh, sentencing phase verdict form these first four all say then count one the second four say count seven but otherwise they're pretty much identical in format and then each one identifies the verdict in the caption of the form of the sentence that it's attached with so you'll have one for life with parole at 25 years life with parole at 30 years, life without parole, and death. That's how they're captioned. And then uh, if you want to follow along in the jury charge they've given you, basically those four verdict forms uh, have the same text statements that you'll see here in paragraphs A, B, C, and D, starting on page 12 of the jury charge. So the first verdict form will read, we, the jury being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find that the aggravating circumstances that the defendant was found guilty of committing do not outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of life imprisonment without parole eligibility for 25 full years should be imposed upon Sean M. Great. The second verdict form uh, would read, we, the jury being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find that the aggravating circumstances that the defendant was found guilty of committing do not outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of life imprisonment without parole eligibility for 30 full years should be imposed upon Sean M. Great. The third verdict form reads, we the jury being duly impaneled and sworn uh, do hereby find that the aggravating circumstances that the defendant was found guilty of committing do not outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case beyond proof or by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole should be imposed upon Sean M. Great. And the fourth verdict form for each count one and seven states that we, the jury being duly impaneled and sworn, do hereby find that the aggravating circumstance that the defendant was found guilty of committing or circumstances that the defendant was found guilty of committing do outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of death should be imposed upon Sean M. Great. To render a verdict, all 12 jurors must agree and sign the particular verdict form. When all 12 jurors agree upon a verdict, all 12 jurors will sign the appropriate verdict form in ink, again with the blue pen that we provide, Date the form and the date you've uh, returned your verdict or will be returning your verdict to the courtroom and inform the bailiff and the bailiff will then return you to the courtroom after the verdicts for both charges have been returned. Should you be a, a, unable to reach a verdict after complete and full deliberations, uh, you shall advise the court accordingly in writing as to either or both uh, of the offenses and you'll then receive further instructions from the court. The four person whom you previously selected, uh, juror 34, may continue in that capacity or you may elect someone entirely different for this phase of the proceedings. The four person again as before will make sure that your discussions are orderly and that each juror has an opportunity to discuss the case and to cast his or her vote. Otherwise the authority of the four person is the same as any other juror. Your initial conduct upon entering the courtroom is a matter of importance. It is not wise to immediately express a determination to assist upon a certain verdict because if your sense of pride is aroused, you may hesitate to change your position even if you later decide that you are wrong. Consult with one another, consider each other's views and deliberate with the objective of reaching an agreement if you can do so without disturbing your individual judgment. Each of you must decide this case for yourselves, but you should do so only after a discussion and consideration of the entire case with your fellow jurors. 
Do not hesitate to change an opinion if you're convinced it is wrong. However, you should not surrender honest convictions or beliefs in order to be congenial or to reach a verdict solely because of the opinion of the other jurors. If during your deliberations you have a question, it should be discussed in the privacy of your jury room. It should not reflect uh, the status of your deliberations and it should be reduced to writing so that there will be no misunderstanding as to what you request. It should then be delivered to the bailiff who will submit it to the court and I will address that with counsel if necessary. I will place in your possession the exhibits and the four verdict forms for each count. The four person will retain possession of the exhibits and the verdict forms and return them to the courtroom when you have reached a verdict. These are the only exhibits you may consider are the ones that are being provided to you today in the jury room. Until your verdict has been announced in open court, you are not to discuss, disclose to anyone the status of your deliberations or the nature of your verdict. Deliberation should take place only when the, all 12 jurors are in the jury room deliberating together. Should any one juror absent themselves at any time, whether they need to make a, a cigarette break or, or some other issue, all deliberations must cease until all 12 jurors are together in the jury deliberation room. If your deliberations uh, continue to a point where we do have to uh, put you up in a hotel for sequestration, you are not to conduct any deliberations while subject to sequestration. They only occur in the jury room back here and nowhere else. The two of you remaining who have been selected as alternates, Juror 133 and Juror 140, um, you must remain and be sequestered until the jury's return to verdict in open court. A juror selected as an alternate is not permitted to participate in the jury's deliberations unless one of the deliberating jurors is found by the court to be unable or disqualified to perform his or her duties. And of course, we've already uh, substituted one of the jurors with an alternate earlier today. So you'll be taken to the Hampton Inn apart from the other jurors and re will remain under the direction of the bailiff until the verdict is reached. Um, the alternate jurors will not accompany the jury to the jury room or part participate in deliberations unless you're called upon or directed to do so by the court. Because uh, there's always that possibility that there could be a family emergency or that you would be required to come in and, and begin deliberations with the remaining jurors, the alternate jurors continue to be a part of the jury panel while the other jurors are deliberating until you're fully released from this case by the court. You shall therefore not discuss this case with anyone or each other or tell anyone how you would have voted until you're fully released from this case by the court. Likewise, you will still remain subject to the court's general admonitions and you're not to read anything about this case, discuss with anybody, don't let anybody discuss with you, don't engage in any social media conversations or communications, don't go out on the internet and all those things that uh, you've been subject to for some time now. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be sequestered during your deliberations in the sentencing phase of this case. It's impossible for the court to determine the length of time that your deliberations will take. Uh, take that time which you believe to be appropriate to be thoroughly and caref to thoroughly and carefully review all the evidence and other information provided to you. The rules uh, to be followed during your sequestration will be identical to the rules which uh, you were asked to follow uh, during the trial phase of this case and you had all received that memorandum from the court uh, giving you some information about that. Uh, anything further from the state or defense counsel before we... Not from the state, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Whitney? Not from the defense judge. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. It's now roughly 4.52 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have uh, the bailiff uh, stick his head in the jury room in about an hour to an hour and a half to see what you want to do for dinner uh, since it'll be approaching well probably in about an hour because that's going to be close to six o'clock in about an hour so probably around six o'clock we'll just check and see if you want to make some dinner arrangements the same will we'll, uh, hold true for the alternates while you're sequestered they'll they'll make sure you get some uh, dinner arranged for you um, 
And just so you know how long I expect you to go tonight, uh, if needed, we have arranged transportation for the jurors at 8.30. So uh, I would ask you um, to deliberate at least until 8.30 this evening. If you don't reach uh, render verdicts by then, <coughs> we'll ask you to conclude your deliberations for the evening and then come back tomorrow um, and continue. But 8.30 is kind of our bewitching hour at which we we have transportation available and after 8:30 we don't so so we need to kind of have you shut things down a little before 8:30 so we can get you where you need to be after that okay this time the 12 jurors may retire to the jury room to begin their deliberations uh, the two alternates will be uh, escorted by the bailiff to uh, the sequestration location And again, make sure alternates that uh, the bailiffs collect your copies of the jury charge since uh, you can't take that with you out of the courtroom. <coughs> 